Hey y'all, today I'm joined by Grant Siegel, one of the partners at Spring Creek Manufacturing, an American manufacturer based in Mountain Iron, Minnesota. These guys make aluminum products for the outdoor recreation industry, as well as industrial workers. So they make everything from canoe stabilizers to truck racks. So Grant, I uh, really appreciate you chatting with me today. I talked with your dad, Tom, a couple of weeks ago about Duluth Pack, but really excited to dive into Spring Creek. Absolutely, Mike. Glad to be speaking with you. And thank you so much for uh, wanting to talk to me about Spring Creek. Uh, so proud to be um, you know, involved with this company and American manufacturer. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I love to talk about Spring Creek and I'm, I'm happy to uh, uh, educate your, your listeners and viewers as well. Awesome. Well, why don't you start off by just telling us a little bit more about yourself and Spring Creek Manufacturing and who y'all really are. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with Spring Creek because then I'll kind of loop together how my involvement Great. started with Spring Creek and, and how I got involved. So um, Spring Creek was founded by a gentleman by the name of Ted Newberg. And now Ted was a high school science teacher in Mountain Iron. And um, he just was an avid outdoors person and he had a passion for the outdoors. And so he was constantly going on uh, canoe trips, specifically uh, going out into the on camping trips and canoe trips in the Boundary Waters, which is uh, a short drive north of where uh, we sit here in Mountain Iron. And so Ted was a innovator and he was constantly, constantly looking for a better way to portage, propel, carry and haul canoes and kayaks. Um, so specifically, his start came where um, he always had a pain in his neck when he would portage a canoe, both literally and figuratively. And so for your viewers that might not know what portaging a canoe is, um, it's when you're paddling a canoe, you get to uh, the end of the lake and you have to carry, get out, carry your gear and your canoe through the woods oftentimes to the next lake and then put in, start paddling again. So a lot of the times that is carried over the top of your head and there's what's called a yoke bar. Um, that you'll carry on your neck. Now, back in the day, so when I say back in the day, 70s, 80s, um, that was pretty much just a aluminum, solid aluminum bar or a wood bar. Maybe there'd be some padding on it, but um, not a ton. And so it was just a fixed point. And he always would, at the end of the portage, he would have a pain in his neck. And he's like, gosh, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so uh, funny story, actually, with that, I talked to his wife and she said that it got to the point where he would actually take old retired football pads from the high school football <laughs> team that he taught at and would bring those up with him because it would lighten the load when you'd be carrying his canoe. And, you know, when you're trying to pack light, it's pretty inconveniencing to be carrying a load of football pads with you. So he's like, there's got to be a better way. And so he came up with what's now called our product, the canoe seat yoke. And what it is, is a tandem portaging yoke, but it's also flips as doubles as a canoe seat. And I'll touch on, you know, where he got the canoe seat part with it, but specifically with the yoke, um, what he came up with is he said, there's gotta be a way to not have that bar sticking onto the back of your neck. And so he came up with a free floating design. If you picture like an oval almost, it's, it's shaped almost like this and it, the yeah. touch points are the gunnel of the canoe. And the pads are free floating. So your neck, you know, there's, there's a bar in the front and a bar in the back, but from the standpoint of it, it's not touching down on your neck or mm -hmm. your shoulders at all. The only point is the pads. And the beauty of it is the pads are adjustable. Not all body types are created equal. There's slender shouldered like Ted was. Um, there's more broad shouldered and everything in between. And so you can actually slide the pads so you get those different pressure points oh, and great. touch points so that it alleviates that, that pressure. So originally he made it for himself for portaging and his family and where the flip side of it comes with the, the, uh, the tandem to the seat is he had a young family at the time and he would go on trips with his friends and his family where they'd be in tandem canoes and um, they're like, hey, I got a young kid instead of having them sit on the ground of the canoe or have to sit on a bucket or a pack, let's find a way to make this into a seat as well. And so you yeah. can get to the back to the water, you can flip it over slide the pads together and it makes a nice comfortable seat. So that was the tandem part of it. Well, like I mentioned, he originally made it for himself and his family. And then he was having people see them stop him at portages and, and things, you know, at the, at the put-ins, at the, at the parking spaces. Yep. If you're like, Hey, what the heck is that? Where'd you get that? Started telling them about it. And Hey, I'd like to buy one of those off you. And it's like, then, you know, he's telling his family, I might really have something here. So 1985 came, he patented the, the uh, canoe seat yoke. Spring Creek was founded in 1985. Um, from there, 
it basically just grew from same type of an innovation thought of, hey, there's got to be a better way to carry a, a canoe on your vehicle with, you know, being yeah. able to do it with the rack systems or portaging them with carts or uh, we have rowing rigs now, stabilizer floats. It's kind of just come from the standpoint of there's got to be a better way to do this and do that. Also, a lot of the, the innovations did come from our loyal customer base. We always say our customers are the smartest people that we know. Right. They offer suggestions and we're like, hey, you know what? Let's, let's try it. And Ted thought of that. Um, and so that kind of grew into where we were then at the point where I got involved. Now, my background is I am an avid outdoors person. Um, I love to fish. I love to hunt. I love to camp, paddle. Heck, even a walk in the woods. This last weekend, it's winter up here in northern Minnesota. I was like, I have to get out of the house. I just took the dogs out for a walk for like two miles in the woods. I just like being outside. It's just who I am. Um, so I always love being in the outdoors. I was born in 1994, so after Spring Creek was founded, but I grew up using their products. I love Spring Creek products. My I, my dad is an outdoors person. He um, got me involved with the outdoors, and we always used Spring Creek gear growing up because it was the best. And I'm not just saying that as somebody now involved with Spring Creek. Yeah. I was that way as a consumer. It just was the best, everything that they did. And so I grew up sitting in a seat yoke. I grew up portaging with a seat yoke. I grew up rowing canoes with their our row packages. Um, and I just, I just love them. So fast forward a little bit here. I'm this is probably 2014, 15. And being somebody who with the outdoors, I always used camping saws and I could never find one that I loved just across the board. Full disclosure, I am hard on equipment. Yeah. I am one of those people that if I can find a break point, I will find it. And if it doesn't break, <laughs> it's quality. I'm just going to say flat out. And so I would always find myself with camping saws that, um, you know, the shape I just didn't quite like because you'd get the full blade contact. It might have folded down nice, but it would, you know, as you started cutting into a log, it would, the depth of it would be sh short. So you could only cut up the small mm -hmm. pieces of wood or you know different things at break points things would bend into it and I just I was like you know what I'd love to find a way to make a saw that was lightweight but yet strong could cut big sized wood logs that people left behind at campsites you know because they were limbing off branches and stuff and so I came up with this idea of a saw that I want to design I was looking for an American manufacturer that could Get, make this for me. And my thought was when I got done with school, I was going to launch my own company, making these saws. Then that's my relationship starts with Spring Creek. I knew of Spring Creek from using their products. Myself and my father, who's also my partner at Spring Creek, thought, you know, let's go speak with the folks over at Spring Creek and see if they could come up with a prototype for us. We'd love yeah. to, you know, obviously have this made in America. That's such, such a passion for us is American manufacturing. And we wanted to support that and make sure we kept it here. And so we, we got involved with Spring Creek and they started prototyping with us and getting involvement there. And years kind of progressed and we came up with the prototype we were just about where we wanted we we're like this is it this is the one we're going to launch it i was finishing up school college at the time and we went to spring creek we we're just about ready to launch it and they told us they go you know um grant we are we can definitely start and, and make this for you but we're struggling um ted who was the founder he grew ill and he unfortunately passed away in 2011 his family took it over um, and they were, were doing things that they, they weren't um, comfortable with, you know, from the business uh, side of things, they were great designers and, and they said, mm -hmm. you know what, we we're, we're not doing so well. Why don't you, instead of just having us make the saws, why don't you buy Spring Creek from us? And it's like, well, you know, that wasn't originally the thought process, but you know, <laughs> let's think about it. And July 1st, 2017, uh, we closed on Spring Creek and, uh, you know, we, we haven't looked back since and, and we love it. And so that's, that's kind of my involvement with Spring Creek where I got started with it and kind of our, our history up into that, up, up into to, to that point. So, yeah, I think it's a great story of a brand that just, uh, like you said earlier, is really connected to its customers. I mean, it's such an eclectic group of products that y'all manufacture for a very specific audience that you wouldn't necessarily think as somebody who is just not an outdoor, a significant outdoor enthusiast or somebody who has a rack on the back of their truck or something like that. And so 
I think it just really speaks to the intentionality and how you, how much y'all listen uh, to your customer base to be able to manufacture just high quality stuff that you know are people people are going to use the crap out of uh, and abuse just like you on your uh, yes. on your camp saws um, and really make sure that those products are the highest quality out there. Absolutely, and that is something that. Um, we we stand behind is is the quality of of the manufacturing yeah. of our product. Um, you know that is one thing, and, and I'm sure we'll touch on this. But that is one thing with American manufacturing is you know what we treat all of our products as an investment, and yeah. it, it, it's it's truly what it is. Uh, is the price point maybe a little bit higher than than others? Yes, we're not going to apologize for that because we treat it as an investment. You're investing in something that you are going to have for many, many years, something you can pass down to the next generations. Um, and it, and that's just something that we're so proud of. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little story here, Mike, that, um, you know, with, with our vehicle racks specifically, um, we originally started making our vehicle racks in the early nineties and we, they're, they're aluminum and they're adjustable. And that's one thing about our racks that I would put up against any other rack on the market is they're not make model year specific. You can yeah. go from a, 1990s Ford to a 2000 Chev to a 2010 Dodge and everything in between. And they're adjustable in height. So different cab heights. If you're going on a Ford Super Duty, that's got a really tall cab or mm -hmm. you've got one with a wider box, they're adjustable up and down, in and out. And it's completely constructed out of aluminum with stainless fasteners. So it's not going to rot. So if you're close to a coast where there's ocean salt air or Super if you're important. upward in our neck of the woods where there is tons of road salt during the winter when they're trying to get the ice off the roads, yeah. Um, it's not going to rot or rust. And so what we've, we, this, getting back to the story here, we had a customer of ours who had bought our racks in like the mid nineties and she actually lived in Missouri. She had family in a city close by to ours. And about two summers ago, she, she just randomly stopped into our shop and she's like, this has got to be spring Creek. And we said, yes, it is. She goes, I need you to come outside and look at my rack on my truck. She said, I have had your sets of racks on my truck since 1995. I have swapped them to three different pickup trucks. Now, my, this is two years ago, so this is 2021. <laughs> um, I have swapped it to three different pickup trucks. I had no idea that y'all were around this area. Um, I just had family in the area and just saw the sticker, saw the town. They said, oh, yeah, you know, their, her family had said, you know, Spring Creek just right down the road. And she goes, no way. And that I... I can tell you right now that is something that we take so proud because find a vehicle rack on the market that's that's going to be that old that's over 30 years old i mean i yeah. mean it's it's and that you've been able to adjust from from vehicle to vehicle it's just you know and she got every dollar's worth out of her racks and and then some and she it, it, you can't even tell that it's been you can't even tell it's been used because it still looks so new um, and, and you know what, that's just something that we take such a, such a high pride in is the quality of the product. Love it. Tell me a little bit more about y'all's manufacturing process. So do you do all of it in mountain iron? Do you have other locations or other manufacturing partners that you work with? How big's your team? Yeah. So we, we are a small, small team here. We do have a few, few full-time, full-time employees during the busy season. We will add some part-time as well yeah. as um, you know, we are, we, when I say we're seasonal, um, a lot of our products are in the paddle sports industry. So, you know, that is a little bit more of a seasonality thing, at least for, for the mm -hmm. full, uh, full United States here. So we, we are a lot busier from um, like March through October. Um, and we get a little bit slower during the winter months. Um, but so we got, we got a small staff here. All of our manufacturing is done in house in mountain iron. Um, and awesome. we do literally all of our manufacturing. So we, we get, we actually just got an aluminum shipment today. Uh, nice. We get aluminum shipments in by the truckload. Um, they are in lengths of what's called an aluminum extrusion, anywhere from 24 feet down to 12 feet and, and everything in between. And we cut, we cut every length up in-house. We drill every length in-house. We tap every length in-house. We bend every length in-house. Every manufacturing process is done in the building that I sit in right now. Um, and we are so proud of that. The only thing that we do subcontract that was a little bit of aluminum welding. We don't do a ton of it, but it's yeah. with a local gentleman. So um, that's awesome. that is the only manufacturing process. If there is some that that is not done in house. 
That's super cool that you take it from complete raw material to finished product all in-house. I visited a fly fishing reel manufacturer a couple of years ago out in Colorado called Ross Reels. They had the exact same process. They brought in raw aluminum and have uh, all of their machinery and their entire workforce in-house and are completely taking it from literally these huge rods of aluminum down to a beautifully crafted fly fishing uh, reel, uh, which was so really cool to see so awesome because you had got something tangible at the end you mm -hmm. see the processes and you know that's where uh, we have you know we have the greatest staff here and, and nothing that gets done through spring creek i mean i know i'm sitting here talking to you mike but nothing gets done in our facility without our employees and and like i said we're a small operation we, everyone wears a lot of hats but everybody has so much pride in our facility with what we do and the product the the end product result is the quality they have so much passion and and i think you know speaking on that i think it goes to where you you see something start from from literally a, a raw length of aluminum or a bucket full of of hardware you know stainless nuts and bolts and yeah. washers to then what you see in the end result and then you know the, the testimony from our product from our customers that they tell us about our products it just it, it makes the pride factor be so much more and it just makes what we do every day um, so much easier to get up and go to work in the morning. I, I mean, truthfully. Absolutely. Well, uh, Grant, I want to shift a little bit of our conversation to maybe some more broader uh, American manufacturing trends in the industry that you're in. Obviously, like I said, you have uh, some really an interesting selection of products that's really catered towards outdoor enthusiasts as well as industrial workers. I'm wondering if you could speak to maybe some of the broader trends that you see in American manufacturing in your categories and what you see for the future. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, now with the outdoor industry, these last few years with COVID, it's been, it's been a weird fluidity with everything. So the outdoor yes. industry as a whole during COVID, um, spiked a lot. Uh, I think what, what happened was, and I always use this term is, um, when people couldn't go out to restaurants, they couldn't go out to bars, bowling alleys, movie theaters, things like that. Um, it forced them to, you know, uh, basically look outside of their front door and go, wow, this thing, this outdoors that's right out in front of us um, is kind of a cool thing. And I, I always say people that had not been introduced to the outdoors got introduced to the outdoors. And those who maybe fell out of touch with the outdoors got reintroduced to the outdoors. So the outdoor industry as a whole grew. Um, we did see a lot of growth with our manufacturing during that time with a lot of our niche products because you know, there's not a lot of, you look around, there's not a lot of stabilizer float manufacturers out there, uh, specifically not the high quality made in America like ours. I, from my understanding, we're the only one. Um, and so a lot of those niche products, we really saw a jump in. And now talking to a lot of uh, partners in that space that are manufacturing in America that might not be um, as niche, um, they, they've said they've, it's been kind of uh, a, a little bit of both uh, where they've seen growth, but then they've also seen kind of like a stagnancy with it. And I think some of that comes in with some of those new introductions came with people that maybe were just dipping their, their foot in the water. Um, and they, they went to where they, they just wanted to start out with maybe a, a, an import product that was a little bit lower MSRP cost. And when they were dipping their foot in, they're like, well, I'm just going to start with this. And then, you know, I don't want to invest in maybe a, a higher quality um, yeah. American manufacturer product. But I always put a spin on it where I say, you know, when it comes to gear and the outdoors, if you're out in the field or you're out in the bush, uh, you want something that's going to stand and be able to be there. Because if it fails when you're out there, you, you're kind of screwed, you know, with yeah. lack of a better term to use. And so I think I always look at it. I think it's going to be positive with the, with the growth of the, the outdoor industry and people getting into it. And sure, some might have dropped off as things kind of open back up. But there are people that, you know, the outdoors is awesome. I mean, I, I might be biased, but I think it's awesome. And so people that that got into it that hadn't been and they stayed into it. I think as they got involved and they grew, they're going to grow their, their, their gear portfolio with a lot of the manufacturers in the United States that make high quality uh, craftsmanship, whether it's forging packs, whether it's, it's, you know, just uh, gear paddles, things like that. Um, they're going to then invest in that quality because, you know, they might have that gear fail that is imported right. that's not as high quality. 
So, yeah, absolutely. And they'll certainly, you know, learn lessons after the first one or two that do fail. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. it's, and it's, we, you know, it's an awesome, awesome industry to be in. I just love it. It's, it's, you know, I probably I'm getting long winded in a lot of these, but I'm just so passionate about the outdoors and what we do. No, we can it's, see it. It's great. Uh, we do see a lot of the data that we collect as uh, our as allamerican.org. We see a couple of really promising trends, both in outdoor recreation and a lot of growth uh, in that consumer segment with folks who are interested uh, in the outdoors and picking up a lot more gear. And then we also see kind of this concurrent trend of just broader American consumers being really passionate and interested about buying American made products. It's really, it's, they often encounter hurdles though, when trying to purchase those around finding what's actually made in America and what's not, especially when you're shopping online, there's really a lack of visibility for searching for the country of origin versus when you're shopping in store. And then also there's obviously headwinds, I think, that really stem from the manufacturing side of things like high price points. Obviously you get what you pay for in a higher quality product, but there are certainly some uh, headwinds as American manufacturers that I think are important to highlight so we can do something about it on uh, things like um, the availability and cost of certain materials domestically versus uh, abroad and some of the legis potential U.S. legislation uh, that comes with that to provide more benefits for American manufacturers and, and sourcing options. And then obviously cost of labor is, is certainly a factor in there uh, as well. But I wanted to give you an opportunity to chat about any sort of maybe some of the biggest challenges that you face as an American manufacturer. You know, obviously we do have, you know, cost of labor and things like that. But are there any specific materials that you have really tough time sourcing domestically or other headwinds that you face as a business that you wish other people would know more about and could do something about? Because I think that's part of our mission as allamerican.org is to really highlight a lot of those issues so that we can do stuff about it and really kind of create uh, a lot of momentum and change within our communities. Absolutely. Yeah. A great, great question. And, and first of all, you know, it takes, I appreciate all you're doing, Mike, you know, at, at allamerican.org. I mean, that's what, what American manufacturing needs is, is people like you beating the drum for American manufacturers and getting that exposure out there because um, you know, when you're, when you're buying American made, you're supporting your neighbors, you're supporting yeah. your friends, you're supporting your family members. I mean, you look at it and you're, you're getting the tangible product. Yes. But the spill down that goes down, you know, the, the employment that you're getting, like I said, with your friends, your family, your neighbors, um, that is what we're so happy and why we're so passionate about American manufacturing. And, and to, to get to the question about the, you know, some of the challenges and hurdles. And I think a lot more what we, what we'll see is just a lot of the sticker shock of the price point. And like you said, I mean, American labor is more expensive. Um, it's a way that, that, that it is. And, and again, we're not, we're not afraid of that. We're happy. We employ the best people here at Spring Creek Absolutely. Um, and, and that they're there to they're feeding their families. And, and that's something that we're never going to apologize nor feel bad for. Um, what we'd love to see, though, is is some from a legislative standpoint is, you know, just even the playing field a little bit with the imports uh, that don't have to deal with those kind of costs for sourcing materials in the states for the American labor is get some of that where it levels the playing field of those costs, because then when you stand up and when you were standing up the product by product, when you put an American manufactured product against an import I seven out of seven days of the week am going to put my money on the American manufactured product from the quality, the craftsmanship, and just the overall passion of, of the, the people that went into making that process. Um, the, the breakdown is always just the cost. Mm -hmm. And I understand that with, you know, the, the way that things are with the, you know, the, the inflations and, and, you know, people are looking to save. And so they'll go towards, you know, maybe a, a little bit more inex inexpensive import, but it's, We'd love to, to see that legislative to to you know level that playing field a little bit you know whether it's the um, you know the importing costs the duty things like that see that to, to where it levels it out because like I said seven out of seven days a week I'm putting that that American craftsmanship and American manufacturing ahead of all else yeah um, and people need to look to you know uh, we put an American flag and we are proud to put an American flag on every single product 
that leaves this facility, every single one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've got pride in that. And but it, we want people to be looking, look for that American flag, whether you're in your grocery or whatever, you know, look for that American flag or, or see where that item is made that you're purchasing. Um, because I'll tell you more than not, uh, the, you, you look at that and it makes you feel good inside. I know I do that when I go shopping for gear or, or like at the store, any, anything. I'm looking for that American flag or I'm looking to see on that label. Um, and so more manufacturers should do that. Fly that flag proud and high. Put that made in the USA on there. Um, it's it's a difficult thing to do, as you know, with a lot of the things that you have to make yep. sure so that you can put that flag and that made in America on your products. Um, but but we we definitely would, would tell people uh, to, to from the highest mountaintops, you, you scream that uh, as, as loud as you can because you, you should be proud of, of the product that you're putting out. Absolutely. And I think the visibility of that information is really important for just making sure that consumers are informed about the products that you're purchasing. So not only on the physical product, but you know whether it's on your website or other marketing materials too, making sure that you have that country of origin uh, really front and center uh, on your product pages and other things is, I think, really important for just helping consumers make informed decisions and obviously supporting Absolutely. domestic manufacturing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it is an investment. You are investing in yeah. a product uh, material and you're supporting your friends, your neighbors and your family. Absolutely. Well, Grant, um, I wanted to give you an opportunity uh, just as we kind of wrap up here to tell us a little bit about what you got going on right now at Spring Creek. I know it's the off off season uh, yeah. for you all, but I think you have a big winter sale coming up. Uh, we and, do, yes. Yeah. Well, what's going Absolutely. on at Spring Creek? We've got a winter sale coming up here. So the 26th through the 31st, we're running a 15% off site-wide sale on our website. So uh, definitely don't uh, pass up on that. It'd be an opportunity to get a, a discounted Spring Creek item. Uh, that's site-wide in all Spring Creek manufactured products on our website through the 26th through the 31st. Um, beyond that, you know, Spring Creek, we, when it comes to the industrial uh, line of products like our truck racks and stuff, when we originally launched the racks, it was kind of designed tailored towards the paddle sports industry. So hauling canoes and kayaks. Um, what we were having was we were having a lot of folks reach out to us and they say, these things are so overbuilt for just hauling a canoe and a kayak. These are way more industrial. They are strong. I, they, people were using them. Um, you know, I, I, I call them the weekend warriors where they would use them in with their, with their paddle sports in the weekend, but then they were using them for contractor jobs during the week. And oh, awesome. you know, folks that were telling us, you got to get these in hands or you got to come up with different types of rack styles that meet the needs of the industrial truck rack line. And so we really, um, since my, my start here at Spring Creek, that's something that we've really tried to grow upon and listen to our customers. Again, we've gotten to where we are by doing that to, Hey, what products are you looking for? Whether it's a, an accessory that goes off of a rack that can, you know, strap down a, a ladder to the side of the rack or, or a, a fire extinguisher mount or a, or a shovel holder, things like that. And different accessories that fit into those, um, into those needs. And so we we're really uh, long, you know, going forward where we're constantly innovating, listening to our customers, looking for new product launches, but also in that industrial line, we're really growing upon that for our, our offerings in the truck rack, industrial space, uh, van rack, accessories, and all sorts of things um, for that nature. So just know that you're getting a quality product. It's made in the United States and it is built to last. I, and, and we try to make it fit for all needs. Amazing. Well, super excited about what y'all have coming up in terms of new products, obviously the sale that's going on at the end of the year and congrats on all the success that you've had so far uh, with Spring Creek. Uh, excited for what's to come with the brand. Awesome. Mike, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and, and uh, talking to your listeners and thank you again for, for all that you're doing at allamerican.org. It's, it's awesome. It's great for supporting American manufacturers and American companies like Spring Creek here. Yeah, thanks, Grant. And to all of our viewers, you can go check out Spring Creek at springcreek.com. You can learn more about them on allamerican.org as well. Uh, and as always, thanks for supporting your country and shopping American-made. See you all next time.